Today, my guest on The Everyday Investor has been a financial professional since 1987. He's written several best-selling books. He's co-founding member, of, or sorry, he's founding member of Euro-Pacific Funds, widely recognized as an economic and financial commentator appearing on Fox News, CNN, CNBC, and now pinnacle of stardom, The Everyday Investor. Peter Schiff, aka Dr. Doom, thanks for joining me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for hosting me on the podcast. I'm looking forward to this chat. So we'll get started. Like, there's a lot of stuff that I want to kind of pick your brains um, on. In 08, for example, you called the financial crisis well in advance, and now you're sounding the alarm, this time with regards to the size of the U.S. debt. So I'd like to eventually get to where this ends up and your views on gold. But to start with, how did the U.S. end up owing $34 trillion? Yeah, well, obviously the world was dumb enough to loan us the money, but um, you know it goes back to the days where the dollar became the reserve currency, and so the world is, you know, looking to accumulate dollars, and not to just hold them in cash, but to lend them out to generate a return, and the preferential way to have done that was U.S. Treasuries because they were the perceived. Uh, safest place to uh, loan your dollars because the U.S. government obviously had the printing press to pay you back uh, if the taxpayers weren't doing it. Um, but because of that, you know, because the world, I think, was willing to lend us money, we borrowed it. And that certainly served the interests of the politicians over the, over the decades because these large deficits enable politicians to promise something for nothing which is how politicians win elections. You know, voters like getting free stuff. They don't like paying for it. And, and so if you deliver government programs, but you don't raise taxes commensurate with the cost of those programs, uh, then you get votes. And so what the politicians did is they borrowed a lot of money uh, in order to provide the voters with the goodies they wanted. And that's how we got $34 trillion in debt. But, you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg because Politicians didn't just borrow money uh, and, and, and spend it. They actually promised voters all sorts of benefits that have never been funded. So that's still a debt. That's still a liability. Social Security, Medicare, uh, guaranteed student loans, guaranteed uh, mortgages, guaranteed brokerage accounts, guaranteed pensions. The U.S. government gave all these benefits to Americans but never funded them. So if you look at the unfunded debt of the U.S. government, which is something that an accountant would look at, you know, on an actuarially sound basis, and the real total debt of the United States is not the 34 trillion that we've borrowed, but 100, 200 trillion of debts that we've guaranteed. Uh, so right. the government is hopelessly insolvent. The entire nation is bankrupt. And it's only a question of when the world is going to acknowledge this and then we have a, a real crisis. So I guess my question around that is like, who is ultimately to blame? Yeah, the politicians made these promises, but say we the people would have gladly accepted that. So is the real source of the problem we the people who aren't necessarily educated enough to really figure out what's going on? Yeah, and they're not necessarily not educated. They're purposely brainwashed in the government school system not to understand this. But yes, you could say, uh, you know, at the heart, it's just the inherent flaw of democracy, that it was all inevitable. But, you know, more specific, uh, you know, places to point the finger, the central bank, the Federal Reserve was particularly culpable. You know, obviously the members of Congress themselves, the, the presidents, you know, they, they did vote to spend all this money, you know, so there's certainly blame to go around. I think the Supreme Court is culpable for allowing a lot of unconstitutional expenditures to continue. So there's plenty of blame to go around. And, and, I, and I've been blaming all of the uh, appropriate uh, contributors, you know, for a couple of decades now, but particularly yeah. over, over the last decade. So in, in more recent history, though, so say from March 2022, to date, the Fed funds rate over there in the U.S. has been increased uh, by around 5%. Over here in New Zealand, it's probably pretty much the same thing. 
but it's it kind of feels like the consensus amongst most commentators here in New Zealand and from what I can understand with the US as well is that there could be a cut sometime next year with interest rates and maybe that would explain why tech stocks and crypto are taking off potentially as a result but what are yeah. your your general views on you know where the Fed might be going next well the markets expect a cut but a cut is not warranted in fact the Fed should continue to hike. So should the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Rates are still too low. And the reason the Fed would be cutting rates is not because they've succeeded in returning inflation to 2%, but because the country can't afford the rates because everybody has too much debt, in particular the government. You know, next year, um, about nine to $10 trillion of that 34 trillion in debt matures, which means it has to be refinanced. Uh, it's currently financed, you know, at very low rates, uh, and it would have to be rolled over at much, much higher rates. In addition, we're adding about a trillion dollars a quarter to the national debt. So that's another four trillion that the government's going to need to borrow. In addition to the nine, 10 trillion, it's going to need to refinance. So you're looking at 13 trillion of, of, of debt. I mean, I just don't think the, the appetite is there around the world. Uh, it's certainly not there in the United States to buy that. So it's going to be it's going to be the Fed. And where does the Fed get the money to buy the bonds? Well, it creates inflation. It prints money. And, you know, by the way, New Zealand is where the whole two percent inflation target got started. That's right. But it didn't get started as a target. That was a perversion. The way it got started is when they reformed you know, in the, you know, the Roger Douglas era, and they, they, they went through these market-based reforms. The rule that was put in place was a 2% inflation ceiling. It wasn't a target. It wasn't like try to hit this target to win. It was stay beneath the ceiling and you win. So if inflation was 1%, that didn't mean that they needed to go up another percent. It just meant that they were OK, that they were below the target. And the further below the target, the better. So if you were at a half a percent, that was better than being at one percent. But other central banks eventually perverted this whole concept to make it a target of inflation. Like you need two percent, that one percent isn't enough. But that was never part of what New Zealand did. They never said that we needed we needed two percent inflation. They just said if we get 2%, that's too much. It needs to be, it needs to be less. 2% was the upper end of what they would tolerate for inflation. But it became the target, and now it's really a floor. Now, this, they don't want it to go below 2%. It went from a ceiling to a floor. Uh, but, you know, we're nowhere near the floor, and I don't think we're going to get anywhere close to it because there's so much inflation in the pipeline. You know, and New Zealand... Uh, you know, you know, fell into this because all the world's central banks were saying, oh, we're below target. We need more inflation. And they kept creating it and creating it. Well, now they went from too little to way too much. Yeah. But, you know, I was pointing out in real time, you know, you, these central banks like the ECB was the was the most ridiculous because their supposed target was close to but below two percent. Like they didn't want to actually hit two percent. But they wanted to get as close as they could to it without hitting it. Like it was like the price is right or something. They, they couldn't go over. And, and so when inflation was 1.7, um, they were saying, oh, we need more. We're too below target. Rates have to stay negative. We have to keep on doing our QE program because we're not close enough to two. We're only at 1.7. And I was saying back then, how ridiculous this is going to look when they blow through 2%. Like we, we, were, we were printing all this money to nudge the rate up from 1.7 to 1.9, and instead we got 10. <laughs> now what do you do? How are you going yeah, exactly. to put that genie yeah. back in the bottle? You can't. Yeah. They're not going to see 2% inflation in the Eurozone again. That's a thing of the past. They're not even going to come close. But it's convenient, though, isn't it? And I guess that that speaks to probably like another thing that I don't remember learning this when I did my economics degree, that's for sure. But why? Is it in our best interest that we have inflation rather than zero as the benchmark or even negative? Yeah, like it's why, not. Why are it's so not. They just made it up. I mean, 
the, it's in the government's best interest to have inflation. And so they have to convince the public that it's good for them because it, you know, that's what they're going to get, inflation, because that's how they give you something for nothing. But inflation is a tax. It's just a tax that the public doesn't realize they're paying. And they actually expect us to believe it. And, you know, we actually do. In fact, the major uh, universities teach this nonsense <laughs> in their economics departments. What these, uh, the, the government economists say is that if prices didn't go up by a couple of percent a year, nobody would buy anything. The economy would grind to a halt. The only reason we buy stuff is because we think the price might go up. And so we mm -hmm. buy it to buy it before the price goes up. Yeah. Um, but if, if we didn't know the price was going to go up, we would just not buy anything and the whole economy would, would implode. <laughs> which, right. So in theory, we, we're, we're afraid of our money losing value. So we're more likely to spend it, which creates economic activity. I think that's kind of like the theory, isn't it? Yeah, but you know, if I know that my money is going to gain value, then I'm more likely to save it. And that is the real engine of economic growth because savings is what finances capital investment. Uh, and, and, but we haven't had enough savings. But it's preposterous to say that people won't buy things uh, if they have an expectation that the price will go down. Because yeah. if people didn't buy things, that they thought would get cheaper. Nobody would buy cell phones. Nobody would buy uh, computers. Nobody would buy televisions. I mean, nobody would buy any consumer electronics. Why? Because if you just wait, you'll be able to get it cheaper. It's because you don't want to wait. There's a value to having it now. So do I really want to wait a year to get the phone that I need today because I could get it 2% cheaper? No, I want to get it right now. <laughs> You know, and I will hope the price goes down because I know eventually I'm going to buy another one. So I want the price to go down. You know, I mean, that's the reason everybody has, you know, giant televisions is because they're cheap. When they first introduced them, they were very expensive and people couldn't afford them. Uh, the reason they bought them is because the price came down. So prices going down, uh, you know, is a good thing. And of course, you know, nobody is going to say, I'm not going to eat today because if I wait, a couple of weeks, the food I want will be cheaper. So I'm gonna starve myself while I'm waiting for the price to go down. No, you buy it <laughs> because you're hungry and you hope that the next time you're hungry, the food is less money. I mean, who would want it to be more expensive? Nobody wants healthcare to be more expensive, education to be more expensive, their insurance to be more expensive. Everybody wants stuff to get cheaper. and. It's better. Now, the other thing they say is, well, if prices go down, businesses can't make any money. Sure they can. They make more money because their costs are also coming down. So their margins are what is important, not the price. But if prices come down along with costs, businesses can make more money because they have greater volume. Right. The cell phone companies make a lot more money today selling phones. Uh, at a much lower price than they sold you know, 20 years ago when the price was much higher, but they hardly sold any units because very few people could afford them. Governments, yeah. through inflation, raise prices, and that's a bad thing. Yeah, that's the fiat financial system in a nutshell right there, right? It encourages mass consumption because your margins really are only, the, you're only getting profit if, if there's a lot of um, throughput, right? A lot of volume through that. So I agreed what you were saying before though around, well, actually interest rates, shouldn't be cut, they should actually be increased, but they can't really be increased. So we now kind of have these two camps evolving, the lower and sooner and the higher for longer camp. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to know like what, which one wins here? Who's going to win this battle? And like at what time frame? Well, you know, I, I, inflation, I think, is going to ultimately overwhelm. Um, you know, the Fed's going to have to surrender. I mean, right now the Fed is still pretending that it's going to be vigilant and it's going to win the inflation battle, you know, no matter the cost. And I think the markets are pretending to believe the Fed. But, you know, it's just a big game of make believe. But at some point, the pretense is going to be gone because the Fed is going to have to reverse course. Uh, I mean, it's not going to have to, but it's going to choose to uh, because choosing not to will be even worse as far as they're concerned. 
Uh, so it's going to go back to uh, money printing. It's going to go back to rate cuts. Uh, and inflation is going to take off because it's not going to be cutting rates from a position of having won the inflation fight, but a position of having lost. So that like that, you know, even just talking about it in the sense of a war, well, immediately I'm just thinking, well, it's, it's just really curious just how the financial system and the geopolitical space seem to kind of move in tandem with these matters. Russia, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, Venezuela now. Like, how far can the U.S. go to support Israel now is like one of the questions I've been thinking about because effectively they can't really afford it. And I guess if they're going to lose the battle in the geopolitical sphere and the financial sphere against the battle against inflation, where does where does that ultimately go? Yeah, I mean, of course, and we have a big problem in, in the Ukraine that we started. You know, that war never should have even taken place. And the only reason that it continues is because the United States continues to finance it. And where does the U.S. get the money to finance it? Because it doesn't have it. So it's borrowing it. And ultimately, the Fed is printing it. So, um, you know, we're just creating inflation. But it's, it's going to come to an end. The markets are going to force it to end. So let's let's kind of go there and go, well, at some sort of time frame, the U.S. reaches the end of the road. They can't keep on printing to repay existing debt. They're losing the battle against inflation. Does that effectively mean the U.S. dollar is losing its reserve currency status? People lose confidence? I think it will lose that status. Yeah, I think at the end of this process, that status is going to go away. And I think the world is going to resort to, uh, uh, you know, go back to gold as the reserve. I mean, central banks have gold. They all have some amount of gold. Uh, they have been increasing their gold holdings. Uh, they need to increase them further. Uh, but ultimately, the holdings will be revalued in the market as the gold price is, is priced much higher. Uh, but that is a much sounder monetary system based on actual money instead of, you know, uh, just fiat. Because what gives currency value, because it doesn't have any value unto itself, is the money that's backing it up. The problem is right now there's no money backing up any of the currency. It's all dollars, but the dollars have nothing behind it either. So I think the world is going to move back to a you know sounder monetary uh, a system, which will you know which will be a benefit for the world, because it will rein in governments. Governments will have to find ways of living within their means. Well, I want to get more into that, like how you see that playing out in a second. But just um, you know, 2024 election year. Donald Trump, you know, there's a real chance he could get back into power. So I'm thinking again about these nation state actors making their moves all around the world, causing a little bit of strife here and there. Where, where does this all go next year in particular? Like, do you think this could come to a head because of an election year in the U.S. next year? Well, I think the election year is going to put more pressure on the Fed, on Powell, to uh, stimulate, uh, to ease and prevent any kind of crisis from happening during that election year. Um, and, and so that's why I think that they're going to go back to QE and, and potentially cut rates next year. Because, you know, the, the, the Fed, despite what they profess to the opposite, it's very political. And the history of the Fed, at least modern history, is that the Fed does what's in the interest of the party that has the White House. And that's the Democrats. That's Biden. The goal of Powell and the Fed is to reelect Biden. So they're, you know, they make that easier if they can prop stuff up. But the problem is inflation is one of the reasons that Biden is so unpopular. And they're not going to solve that problem by creating even more inflation. That's interesting. OK, so like just thinking about um, going going back to what would happen if the, the U.S. dollar did lose its status as the world's reserve currency, thinking about China as the common denominator in a lot of areas in terms of countries, other countries that want to trade with each other. Often it's China might start playing a bigger role there. Um, you mentioned also central banks and gold seem to go hand in hand. So how how would it work in practice if there was a, a change in the U.S. dollar as world's reserve currency to something else? Would it be linked to a, a basket of goods or would it be linked, sorry, to a basket of currencies or gold? How do you see this playing out? Well, as I said, I think it makes a lot more sense uh, to remonetize gold. Gold's worked as money in the past and it would work even more efficiently as money uh, in the future. You know, I think the process of de-dollarization has already started. 
Uh, it's pretty obvious that nations are trying to work out ways to trade with each other without involving the U.S. dollar. You know, you have U.S. dollars that are part of a transaction that doesn't even involve the United States, right? If India is, is trading with China, why should they be invoicing each other in dollars? I mean, what's the point? The U.S. isn't involved in the transaction at all. So they want to disintermediate the United States because they don't want to have to be beholden to the United States uh, because we're using, they're using our currency. And we made them painfully aware of the inherent risks of being in that position with the sanctions against Russia. I mean, that was a real wake-up call around the world, uh, which was a reason that it was a huge mistake to have done that to remind the world that they need to get rid of their dollars because we depend on the world using our dollars uh, for our whole standard of living. We shouldn't have jeopardized that, you know, by calling attention to this the way we did, by, by punishing Russia uh, the way we did. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, you, th that accelerated the, the, the desire and the impetus to de-dollarize. So it's happening. And, and I guess that kind of leads me to my next question is like from an investor's perspective, if they're thinking about investing in the U.S. market versus holding gold, either in the physical or through funds, why gold and, and why now? Is, is it because it's like and we're looking at the price here reaching all time highs recently? Is it because this this trend for de-dollarization is increasing? Is that kind of what's driving the, the gold investment thesis right now? Well, I mean, I don't think it's driving it yet. I think it will, because I think if that was driving it, gold would already be a lot higher. So I just don't think investors have connected the dots yet. I think they're still, uh, you know, in the dark about this. I think they still have a lot of confidence in the system, in the central banks, in the Fed. Uh, and so I don't think we've had the game changer yet. I think there's going to be a wake up. I think there's going to be a, a, a moment, uh, you know, uh, a emperor has new clothing type of awakening. And that will, you know, ignite a rush to buy gold. And so then the price, I think, will move up dramatically from here. And all the equities, the gold mining equities that, you know, are continue to have gold stocks are getting clobbered today, even though the price of gold isn't even down. It's, you know, a little bit below 2000. Uh, but the Nasdaq, the Russell 2000, the S&P, the Dow, they're all at 52 week highs today. So, you know, everything is awesome as far as uh, the mainstream investors are concerned, and even you know the big boys, uh, you know Wall Street investors are they're you know yeah. completely whistling past this graveyard. We're in a bizarro world still, right? Okay, so um, now before we started record, I, I was like I was vaguely aware of this happening in the background, and and you brought it up as well. So I just want to understand a little bit more of the story, just from your perspective around what's happened recently with the this lawsuit that you've won with 60 Minutes in Australia. And um, amongst other others, trying to kind of, I, I'm trying to understand what what went on there. And can you just start by giving me the the overview of that story? Yeah. Well, the reason you don't know about it is there is a deliberate effort on the part of the mainstream media down under to cover this up. Now I know why Channel Nine wants to cover it up because I exposed them as complete frauds, uh, and so they want to cover it up. But why do their competitors want to cover it up? Nobody is covering this story. And in fact, the way uh, uh, Channel 9 is trying to spin it is as if they didn't even lose. They've been claiming that it was settled and, uh, and, and, and so they didn't lose. They didn't settle it. Not only, they lost and they lost badly. I beat them seven times in a row. I got seven consecutive judgments against them in a federal court in Australia because everything they kept saying was ruled to be a bunch of BS. And so rather than lose an eighth time, right, because the only thing that it had come down to by that point, after they lost seven times in a row, the only issue left to decide was how big the check was going to be that they were going to have to write me. That everything else was already decided by the judge. So only when we got to that point did they say, OK, we surrender. You know, we give up. We'll consent to you getting the maximum amount of money you could possibly get, right? And at that point, I was like, all right, I guess I got to accept your surrender 
because if I didn't accept their surrender, they threatened to use that against me later on by saying, hey, we offered the surrender and give him everything. He didn't take it and he made us spend more money on lawyers. You need to make him pay our legal bills. So to avoid having to pay their legal bills after they surrendered, I accepted their surrender. I said, OK. And so what they did is they told the judge, we lose. We consent to you issuing a judgment against us for the for, you know, for the, the maximum is actually 460,000. So they gave me 550,000 Australian dollars and they said, we'll pay all his costs. And they consented to judgment against everybody, which was five respondents. I sued the, the age, 60 minutes, Nick McKenzie, Charlie Grieve, and then the producer, Joel Tozar of the 60 minute segment. So all five of them surrendered and all five of them were ordered to pay me, but they're trying to pretend uh, that they didn't lose because they settled. Yeah, they, they, they didn't settle. It's like I, I had them in a chokehold in, in the octagon and, and, and they tapped out because they were about to pass out. And then they claim that they that they settled the match by tapping out, you know, like that they lost. What happened, though, that le led to this outcome? Because it involved it involved. Yeah. The bank, right? OK, so here's bank. the backstory. The the government. And I, I haven't been able to get all of the pieces because the reporters, you know, are bearing the evidence and protecting their corrupt sources. But somebody, either in the U.S. government at the IRS or maybe at the Australian ATO, somebody told Nick McKenzie and Charlotte Grieve that my bank was being investigated in this joint investigation called Operation Atlantis uh, from the J-5. They didn't even tell me I was being investigated. Apparently, they, they told the reporters, but they never told me, right? So anyway, they told these reporters, and they leaked them, you know, selective pieces of information, you know, about bank customers, that customers that were at the bank, right? And a couple of them, two or three, had, had, had some criminal records, right? Uh, and, and so they, they then took this information and embellished it. And, and misreported it. And in fact, through discovery, because I only got this information because I sued, I got the actual notes of the conversations that took place between these reporters and people they interviewed for the stories, which would be former customers of the bank, former employees of the bank, referral agents. And everybody they talked to, without, everybody, without exception, told them how strict my bank's compliance was, that it was like over the top, like it was more, more uh, stringent than any bank that it, they had ever experienced, that compliance was so bad to the point of being annoying, to being a pain in the butt, where people were not using the bank because it was, there was too much regulation, right? So they had all this information, and they didn't have any information um, regarding any criminality, any criminals using my bank, any tax evaders. So they came out and they did this uh, story. And they accused the bank of laundering money for criminals, uh, of, of having a huge clientele of, of organized criminals, of drug traffickers, uh, helping people launder money to pay taxes. They said we didn't do any compliance. You know, they misquoted people. They, they, they doctored their own evidence. They, they, they took stuff out of context and they totally fabricated a lie and they passed it off as actual journalism uh, when it was just political fiction. I put this interview they did of me and this is the fraud starts from the beginning because the reporter, Charlotte Grieve, right? She contacted me. She's this reporter from The Age. And she said, hey, you know, I've come across Peter Schiff on the Internet. We're interested in his views on gold and inflation or the economy. Could we interview him? And so on that basis, they arranged an interview. Well, when I get there, she's not even there. She was the one that was supposed to interview me. I get there. There's this other guy, Nick McKenzie, there. And, you know, I even asked Nick McKenzie, hey, Nick, you know, so what did you want to talk to me about? He goes, well, I'm going to talk to you about the economy and how it affects Australia, you know. So then we start the interview. He asks me like one or two questions about the economy and then immediately starts talking about my bank and then accusing me of using my bank to help criminals launder money and evade taxes. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what the hell? You know, like this is not the topic that you asked me to discuss, but I discussed it with him for almost an hour. 
But I kept telling him, look, stop asking me questions about the bank. I don't work at the bank. I can't really give you these answers. And this interview is not supposed to be about the bank. That's not what I agreed to. So, like, let's stay on topic, right? But anyway, they took that 50-minute interview and edited it completely out of context. Because at the end of the interview, I finally was like, okay, look, that's it. I'm done with this. You keep asking me these questions. I've told you to stop. I've told you to move on. I've answered your questions. I'm just ending the interview. And I take off my mic and I leave. And that became the whole focus of the whole piece. They started the piece with me taking off my mic. They ended it. They made it look like I had something to hide, that I was, you know, I was guilty. And they, you know, I mean, and they created this, this, this 60 Minutes episode, which was ruled defamatory. They've now removed it from the Internet. But the minute they, they showed this doctored interview, and it wasn't just me. I've spoken to other people who they've interviewed, and I got the real interviews. And they, they, they lied about everything. They, they take everything out of context, and they, they misrepresent what they're actually told. Right? So it, it, what you see, and this is on 60 Minutes, what you see on this program can't be believed. It is not news because the reporters are not honest. They are not presenting their actual findings of what they have purported to investigate. They twist whatever they found to justify the conclusion they made before the investigation began. See, they decided that my bank wasn't following the rules, that we weren't doing our compliance, we weren't doing Know Your Customer, we weren't doing KYC. But when all of their evidence proved that their initial premise was wrong, instead of accepting that they were wrong and just you know moving on, they're like, well, we don't care. We're just going to pretend the evidence confirms what we thought, even if we have to lie about what we found, which is what, what they did. But so the actual, the, the interview, after they, they aired this thing on 60 Minutes, I was demanding that they show my whole interview. I was like, look, just show the people what I actually said. Don't show them what you're pretending I said. Show them what I actually said. And, and, and they refused. Part of the lawsuit and part of the reason I sued them <laughs> and spent, you know, close to a million Aussie dollars, right, which they have to pay me back now. But one of the reasons I did that was to get that video, <laughs> which I have since put on the Internet. You can go to my YouTube channel, right, uh, and see the video, the whole 50 minutes. I even included the beginning where I asked him, what's the interview going to be about? And he lies to me and says it's going to be about the, the global economy before he ambushed me on, on the bank. Because none of that stuff I said about the economy made it on the 60 Minutes. That, that was all part of the lie to kind of catch me off guard. You know, it, in the Age article, it said, you know, when we caught up with him at his home and asked him about his bank, his guard was down. I mean, my guard wasn't down, but they did what they could to lower my guard by lying to me. I'm going to be suing the Age again and 60 Minutes for injurious falsehood because I identified at least 40 plus individual statements that were made that were actually false. And not just false, but that the reporters knew the statements were false at the time they made them. <laughs> After I won the case and I tweeted, or I didn't tweet, I posted on X <laughs> that I was going to like release this uh, video of the, un of the unedited broadcast the lawyers for 60 Minutes went to court. They filed an emergency order to try to hold me in contempt, and they wanted a judgment to prevent me from showing the unedited video. <laughs> and the lawyer for, for, for the Nine Network said that the public should not be allowed to see the inner workings of a broadcaster. So the public can't see the truth just the lies that we choose to tell them, right? That's it. That they can't see the actual interview, only the way we cut it and slice it up. That's all they're allowed to see, right? We, you can't see how the sausage is made. Just eat it, right? Um, but they, they actually lost that. They actually had it. And, and what happened, it was funny because the judge said, that was a good judge, this guy, uh, Hugh Jackman's uh, a brother, you know, not to undercut him because he's successful in his own right. But people know who, who Jack, Hugh Jackman is, you know, Wolverine. This is his brother. I liked him. He was a good guy. Um, and, but, and he's, and, but he told them, he said, are you sure you want to go down this road? Because, you know, if I rule on this, it could be very embarrassing. It could hurt the reputation 
of your two reporters. So why don't you check with them before you proceed? And, and then I, after that, they withdrew the whole thing. And then they were ordered to pay my cost again. So in a way, that represented my eighth win against them, right? Because before I had seven wins in a row, this would be win number eight. Um, but it, 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 the bottom line is the whole thing is a fraud. And it's amazing that this is not getting out there because Channel 9 is a major uh, network in Australia and probably a lot of people in New Zealand watch it. 60 Minutes is a big news show, in quotes, news. Yes. This guy, Nick yeah. McKenzie, two days after he lost the defamation suit, he won an award, and a big award in Australian journalism, and they named a, an annual prize, a grant, where every year somebody's going to get $10,000 for the Nick McKenzie Award for Investigative Journalism. That's like giving Bernie Madoff, right? A, 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 an asset manager award in the name of Bernie Madoff or coming up with a, a uh, you know, a crypto pioneer award in, in the name of Sam Bankman Freed, right? Or maybe having an award named after Harvey Weinstein, you know, or I mean, it's just so ridiculous. The guy is a fraud. He lied. Uh, he, you know, he deliberately distorted the truth. And what's really bad is Charlotte Grief won in 2021 this company city in Australia. They have these annual journalism awards. She won the award for excellence in journalism, best young journalist of the year, specifically for the 60 minutes program, Operation Atlantis, that was ruled defamatory, was removed from the internet, and where she was ordered to pay me $550,000 for defaming me. Now, I've tried to contract that news, that, that city, and say, hey, wait a minute. You gave an award to this reporter for a broadcast that was actually defamatory, and they had to take the whole thing down. Are you going to rescind your reward? Are you going to ask Ms. Grieve to return that award that was given to her for excellent journalism? Or does city re regard defamation as excellent journalism? Because to me, that's the lowest form of journalism. That's the worst thing you can do as a journalist. I mean, how often does a journalist lose a defamation lawsuit? It's pretty rare. You know, it's hard. They, there's freedom of the press. They have a long leash. You have to really go above and beyond, right, to lose a defamation case. And that's what happened. She lost this case and lost it badly. I beat the crap out of her and Nick McKenzie. They had nothing. They didn't have a shred of evidence. Their case was so weak that the judge threw it out three times in a row. But if they didn't have any evidence, why did they make the accusations? Why did they accuse me of, of laundering money and of evading taxes and doing all this bad stuff without a shred of evidence that I actually did it? You know, why and, then? Yeah. So like in your opinion, why, why do you think this all went down? Because clearly it was based on some allegations that later on proved to be, correct me if I'm wrong, unfounded, but right. why, but they why shouldn't do you have even, that this But happened? they shouldn't have even reported that I was under suspicion because what if it turned out I was innocent? Because they destroyed my whole bank. I lost tens of millions of dollars. What I'm getting for winning the defamation suit just is, doesn't even come close to making me whole on what this whole thing uh, cost me. I mean, if they had any integrity, they just would have kept their mouth shut and waited for the investigation to run its course. And then if they charged me with something, okay, do your report. But they ended up accusing me of stuff that not only did I not get convicted of, I didn't even get charged with it because there wasn't any evidence to even charge me, let alone convince the jury that I actually did it. But to answer your question, what was the reason they did it? I think it was politics. I think they support more government and more regulation in Australia, more anti-money laundering. Uh, they wanted to get more regulations on accountants and lawyers and realtors. And to do that, they wanted to create this phony situation and use my bank as the example. And that, of course, you know, uh, they're uh, very liberal. In fact, they're only, or not liberal, just, you know, socialists. Their only defense, and Judge Jackman kept like, you know, nailing them on this, but they kept saying, what's your evidence that Peter Schiff is evade, helping criminals evade taxes? I said, well, he, he believes in low taxes. 
He thinks taxes are too high and they should be lower. He thinks that people should try to minimize their taxes. So, well, yeah, he doesn't like big government. He thinks government is corrupt. It's like, <laughs> so it was all because of my politics. That was their whole argument against me. He's guilty because he's a conservative or he's a libertarian. That was it. That's all they had. And the judge is like, well, you can't make Man. that leap. But that's, that's the leap that they made. I am revealing a cancer in uh, Australian journalism, but I can't remove it. <laughs> the people in Australia have to do something for themselves. I've just given it to them on a silver platter. See, the problem is most of the people they defame and lie about don't have the resources to fight them. And so they get away with it. Well, yeah. I had the resources. I fought them. But they're still getting away with it because the money they paid me is nothing. This is a major publicly traded corporation, right? So it's a, it's a parking ticket. We need the public to be made aware that they lost. This is a fascist situation where you have this unholy alliance between corruption in the media and corruption in government because the government officials who leaked this information to the reporters were corrupt because the leaks were illegal. They're not supposed to leak the target of the investigation. It's definitely something like I, I didn't I didn't bargain for that story. Like that's quite that's quite full on. So what, oh, yeah. what, you're, what you're suggesting is like um, that this allegation was turned into basically a trial through the media, which was effectively a, a witch hunt. Uh, yeah, the bank like ended I'm up losing so much money time. based on the bad yeah. publicity that regulators shut it down because it, it didn't have enough capital left. But I think the, there was a lot of pressure by the media and the IRS to shut it down so they could make an example of how tough they are on money laundering and tax evasion. Because everybody thought my bank was helping people launder money and evade taxes because the media had accused it of that, that there was pressure to shut it down to show that money laundering and tax evasion wouldn't be tolerated. Nobody in the government wanted to stand up and say, wait a minute, these allegations are false. They're not doing that. The bank isn't doing that. We've investigated them, and, and, and we didn't find any evidence of that. They found nothing. Nobody at my bank was charged with anything. Nobody was fined uh, with, at all related to money laundering or tax evasion or any of that stuff. And to my wow. knowledge, not a single customer. We had thousands of customers. And by the way, they put my bank in the receivership. It's been almost 18 months, and nobody's got a nickel. Nobody's got their money. All the money is there. I, my bank was 100% reserved. We didn't make any loans. And in fact, in the 16 months from when the articles came out in Australia and when the local regulators put the bank in receivership for being undercapitalized, 75% of the customers' deposits were withdrawn by the customers, over $200 million. And every nickel was sent out the day it was requested. I had no problem. What bank in the world could have a run where 75% of the money is withdrawn and they just send it out, no problem. I had no problem because we didn't make any loans and we could have sent out the other 25% if the government hadn't prevented us from doing it. And it all started based on the media. Had 60 Minutes Australia, had The Age, and they also teamed up with the New York Times. So you know they got uh, their blood uh, on their hands too. But if it wasn't for this media event, nothing ever would have happened, nothing. My bank would be thriving today it would be much bigger, even more successful. I'd be making a ton of money. All the customers would have all their money, access to all their money. Nobody would have been inconvenienced. Puerto Rico would be doing great because they'd be collecting a lot of taxes from my bank, uh, from all the employees and, and profits, and we would be generating economic activity here in Puerto Rico. I think we would have been the crown, I mean, the, the jewel in the crown of Puerto Rican banking. Instead, the whole banking industry has been destroyed based on the false connection between my bank and money laundering and tax evasion. To this day, the stigma is still out there. People still think that my bank was facilitating money laundering tax evasion, even though it wasn't. <laughs> this was the biggest criminal investigation of tax evasion and money laundering in the world. Five governments combined together, combined resources. And they went through my, my bank with a magnifying glass. We provided hundreds of thousands of documents on thousands of accounts and they couldn't find anything wrong with one, not one. Yeah, no, I appreciate, appreciate you sharing that and this will definitely be part of it. So uh, we've covered, man, we've covered a ton of ground today. Um, 
And so I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Peter. Oh, my Peter. pleasure. If people, people want to follow you, obviously you've got the Peter Schiff show. I'm going to put links all over the show notes so people can follow you. But what else would you recommend if people want to follow you? Twitter, perhaps? Yeah, well, follow me on Twitter. I've got almost, or X. But I keep saying Twitter. Follow me yeah. on X. It used to be Twitter. I've got almost yeah. a million followers. So I, I try to put some good stuff out there. But I'm yeah, also no, on no, Instagram, Facebook, yeah. TikTok. I mean, you can yeah. find the real Peter Schiff. You know, you'll, you'll find yeah. me out there. Cool. Um, no, I really appreciate it. And, you know, yeah. my asset management company, we, we manage money. I mean, the bank is gone, mm -hmm. but I still, uh, you know, help people all around the world uh, manage their portfolios. So check out uh, Euro Pacific Asset Management. And I sell yeah. precious metals. I mean, we're, you know, we're in, uh, I don't know whether we're really dealing in New Zealand yet through Shift Gold, but my goal is to expand yeah, yeah. Uh, all over the world. I just recently reacquired Shift Gold. I had sold it about seven years ago to Gold Money. I bought it back. And one of my goals is to really grow the business uh, and, 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 and make it more of a, of a you know, worldwide uh, retailer of physical precious metals, not, not just here in the United cool. States. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, well, yeah. Th thanks again, Peter. It was, it was really awesome to be able to speak to you, and hopefully we'll catch up again soon. Okay, take care. All right.